How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has ordained his blessing, life forevermore. Let us stand and sing together.
on this fourth Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of peace, and the Magnuson family has come forward to light that candle for us this morning. And as they do, we pause to consider together what it means to find peace in our world today. Let's join our voices now in our Advent prayer. Come, light of the world. Come, live in our hearts. Come, move in between us. Come, shine in the darkness. Our first candle shines for hope. Our second candle shines for love. Our third candle shines for joy. And our fourth candle today shines for peace. For peace is needed now in our world. Peace is a hunger and peace is a gift, a gift of the Christ child born in the night. Come, light of the world, be our peace, we pray. Amen. to remain standing and pass the peace of Christ to one another. You may be seated. Well, again, welcome to you all on this fourth Sunday of Advent, this very tender week that we enter into as we prepare for Christmas Eve, as we prepare for Christmas Day to celebrate the coming of Christ, the light into the world once again. And especially warm welcome with you this morning if you are a visitor among us. We invite you to grab a hello card that's in the pew in front of you and write your information on there. And also, if anyone has any prayer requests, feel free to write those on the back of those cards and place them in the offering plate later in the service. Of course, we will turn your attention toward our Christmas Eve schedule later this week. We also have our longest night service coming up this coming Tuesday. We have two services for the longest night, one at noon and one at 6 p.m. in the chapel. And that service is a service of darkness honoring both the darkness on the longest night, but also it is a blue Christmas service, a time for reflection, a time for acknowledging our losses this past year, and a time for peace and quiet in the midst of this very busy week. So we hope you'll join us for longest night on Tuesday. And then, of course, we invite you back on Friday for our Christmas Eve services. We have services at 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 1, 3, and 5 p.m., and then a service of lessons and carols at 9 p.m. We hope you can join us. We also give thanks for your generosity every single day of the year, the ways that you share your time and your talents and your treasures with us. We'll remind you that 20% of our year and or of our year budget comes in the month of December. So we invite you to remind or remember us, I'm sorry, in our year end giving in the next few weeks, in your year end giving, and um, we give thanks for your gifts. We also have a pastoral announcement to make this morning as well. This past Thursday evening, friend of this congregation and longtime pastor in the Twin Cities, the Reverend Dr. Arthur Rauner passed away. Those of you who are in this service often know that Dr. Rauner and his wife Molly came and sat over in that fourth pew almost every Sunday. They would go to Colonial Church, which was their home church, and then they would come here to see their daughter, Kristen Jidey, and their grandchildren. And so we give thanks for Arthur and his presence among us, the way that he has shaped really the Twin Cities in so many ways, shaped our life of faith most definitely. A service of celebration of life will be planned for the new year, and we'll let you know when that comes. 
And we have been waiting for so long for our associate clergy member, Dan Stark, to come. And today is his very first Sunday among us. So Dan is here. We give thanks for Dan. <laughs> Just last Sunday, Dan wrapped up with his congregation in Milwaukee. He hopped in the car after that service on Sunday, and he and his family moved here this past week. They're settling into their new home in Maple Grove, and Dan begins his work among us, and we are so grateful for his time and talent and the ways that he will impact us and change us as a congregation as well. So we give thanks for this community, and we give thanks for worship this morning. Let's continue now in worship. thank you for these gifts which we receive now. We give you thanks for every gift that you have given us, and we pray that we would use all the good things you shower upon us to do good work in the world. In your name, amen. I'm going to invite Dan to come forward and read our scripture passage for today. You may be seated. The 46th Psalm. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change, 
Though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow. He shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. By the end of August 1914, the German army had advanced deep into France, inflicting over a quarter million casualties on the French army alone. By December of that year, the Germans were dug in along a line that ran from the English Channel to the Swiss border. Across from them, sometimes less than 100 feet away, were the Allied forces of French, British, Scottish and Irish soldiers themselves dug in. 440 miles of trenches, barbed wire, machine gun positions, and heavy artillery made up the Western Front of the Great War. Between the opposing trenches was no man's land, littered with the bodies of the slain. The issues that had precipitated the war were lost on most of its combatants. The assassination of an Austrian duke, anti-Serb riots in Sarajevo, increased tensions between Germany and Russia. To the average 18-year-old Brit, these conflicts seemed a million miles away. Nevertheless, when German forces invaded France and pushed west, off to war the Brits went. Well, you go to Flanders, my Malio. Well, you go to Flanders, my. Malio, there will get wine and brandy and sack and sugar candy. Well, you go to Flanders. By December, the war on the Western Front was a virtual stalemate. Both sides were entrenched and neither could break the other's lines. A cold, wet rain fell for days, turning the trenches into cesspools that froze at night and melted into knee-deep muck during the day. Men on both sides slept standing up, leaning against walls of decomposing sandbags. Otto Dix, a German soldier, described it thusly, lice, rats, barbed wire, fleas, shells, bombs, underground caves, corpses, blood, liquor, mice, cats, artillery, filth, bullets, mortar, fire, steel. That's what war is. 
It is the work of the devil. Christmas approached. On December 7, Pope Benedict XV requested a Christmas truce, saying, in the name of the divinity, I beseech thee to cease the clang of arms while Christendom celebrates the feast of the world's redemption. To which British Brigadier General G.T. Walker countered, friendly intercourse with the enemy, unofficial armistices and exchanges of tobacco and other comforts, however tempting and occasionally amusing they may be, are absolutely prohibited. On either side of the front, Christmas items began arriving to the trenches, cigarettes, tea, chocolate, small Christmas trees. The Germans put candles on their trees and set them atop the bulwarks. Brits filled gunny sacks with cigarettes and tea and flung them across no man's land. Little gifts preceding the holy day. Journalists later said that they dared not report on these small acts of peace lest the army's commanders catch wind and crack down. Christmas Eve dawned. And the fighting continued as it always did. But as the day progressed up and down the western front, the rat-tat-tat of rifles and the ground-shaking booms of artillery slowly ceased, giving way to a silence that the men had not heard in months. 26-year-old British Lieutenant Charles Bruce Bairn's father felt a sense of strangeness in the air. The lack of shooting as the sun set on Christmas Eve led him to write in his diary. It was just the sort of day for peace to be declared. I came out of my dugout and sloshed along the trench to a dry lump, stood on it, and gazed at the scene around, the stillness, the stars, and now the dark blue sky. From where I stood, I could see our long lines of zigzagging trenches and those of the Germans as well. Songs began to float up from various parts of our line. The first Noel the angels did sing was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay, in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. No. one point on the front, a German soldier tied a white napkin to the barrel of his rifle and stuck it up in the air. Then, to the horror of his comrades, he stuck his head up above the rim of the trench. Slowly, he climbed out and walked into no man's land. A British soldier followed suit, and they met in the middle. Other men followed. They shook hands, exchanged gifts, and made agreements that there would be no more shooting until each side had buried their dead. At another spot on the front, Germans held up a crudely painted sign in broken English, you no fight, we no fight. The Brits replied with a sign that read, Merry Christmas. They too met in no man's land, where each side took turns singing carols. Renowned opera tenor Walter Kirchhoff visited the front lines with the German crown prince. He later wrote that in the distance he heard gunfire and mortar blasts, but in the trenches, every dugout had a Christmas tree, and there was no shooting. 
The prince feared going too close to the front line, so Kirchhoff ventured forward alone. He handed out gifts to the men and sang a song. And when he stopped, the opposing French forces climbed to the tops of their dugouts across no man's land, applauded, and demanded an encore. So he sang another. Es ist ein Rosensprungen aus einer Wurzelzeit. Wie uns die Alten sungen von Jesse war die Art. Und hat ein Blümlein bracht, mitten im kalten Winter, vor zu dir halben Nacht. There is something about that night, something that brings the prophecy of the psalmist to fulfillment, that the Lord makes wars to cease, that he breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. The tools of war are ineffectual in the presence of the loving God. Those men in 1914 knew it. In their guts and souls, they knew that to fight on Christmas Eve would be an offense to the Prince of Peace, to the one of whom Paul writes, he himself is our peace. In the first recorded Christmas sermon in the year 386, John Chrysostom preached, Bethlehem this day resembles heaven. A very earthly place, Bethlehem, full of grit and dirt, Mess and filth, the stench of livestock in a barn, a city bursting with tourists and a people who were oppressed by an invading imperial army. Not a very peaceful place. Yet, the sense we get when we read the gospel according to Luke or imagine the nativity scene in our mind's eye or pass an illuminated crash on the side of the road is peace. Because on that night, that very earthly place, rife with conflict and strife, did indeed for a few hours resemble God's everlasting kingdom of peace. A British correspondent covering the Great War reported that at midnight on Christmas Eve, he heard a village church bell ringing in the distance followed by a clear and beautiful tenor voice singing. Pour effacer la tache originelle et de son père arrêter le courroux. Le monde entier tressaille d'espérance en cette nuit. We 
each have our enemies, don't we? The question for each of us is whether we are courageous enough to climb out of the trenches we have dug and venture into no man's land with outstretched hand and open spirit. In the stillness of the silent night, with whom do you need to make peace? A family member? A colleague? A former spouse? Or friend? To whom do you need to offer a white flag? Who needs to see you holding up a sign that reads, I know fight, you know fight. You know who it is for you, I know who it is for me. The Prince of Peace is calling for a Christmas truce. Listen, listen to his call. Albert Moran of the 2nd Queen's Regiment listened. And years later, he remembered, it was a beautiful moonlit night, frost on the ground, white almost everywhere. There was a lot of commotion in the German trenches and many lights. And then they sang, silent night, stille Nacht. I shall never forget it. It was one of the highlights of my life. Stille Nacht, heilige Nacht, alle schläft einsam wacht, nur das traute Hoch
I would invite you to join me in a spirit of prayer. Gracious and Holy One, you are our refuge and strength, our peace and truce maker. You are present with us now and always, although the storms of life rage on around us, although war and violence erupt, although chaos and unrest and tumult are our reality, you are with us. And even though the days get shorter and colder and darker, you walk with us over the peaks and through the valleys of life. You, Emmanuel, God with us, the Prince of Peace, the light of the world, are the one who will bring us peace. Touch us with hope, with love, with joy, and only the priests that you can bring. I ask this in the name of the one who taught his friends and each of us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A few reminders for you. One, if you are in need of prayer, one of our CCMs, Dana Essex, is back at the prayer room, and she would be honored to pray with you before you go. Second, this is our very last night for Christmas Story and Lights, our drive-through Christmas experience, so it's not too late to pile your family and friends in the car tonight between 5 and 8 and drive through and hear the Christmas story and see it come to life. And of course, we hope to see you back this week for the longest night and also for Christmas Eve as well. I want to thank my longtime friend, Ben Johnson, for singing uh, as part of my sermon. He is part of a 
a production called All is Calm that you can see at the Ritz Theater, put on by Theater Latte Da. You can also see it on PBS from when they performed on Broadway a couple years ago. So my thanks to Ben. Ne yes, okay. Yes. Now receive this benediction. Go in peace. For what does the Lord require of us? To do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. Amen. Thank you.